Father, we thank you that you left heaven and came to planet earth, releasing yourself and becoming us, leaving your glory and taking our bodies, leaving the heavenly beings and being born in Bethlehem, so that we may know God, our Father, that you became nothing so that we can be something. Paul would say, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, he became poor so that you may become rich out of his poverty. You emptied yourself so that we can see and touch God. This evening, Lord, your children have come. They're seeking your face. They want to meet you. They want to hear from you. They want to open and share their love with you. They want to open and share their love with each other. And so come meet us and come talk to us. We bless your name because you are always there. And we honor you because you are the Lord God Almighty. Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. I do want to say welcome to the service family because we have men, women, young people, boys and girls. If there are little ones here also, we shall soon find out. Because their span is very small, they'll begin to talk. I want to bless God for you, Provost, because you invited me to come here. So Sunday, I was here. Monday, I was here. Yesterday, the Archbishop was here with a, a panel of people. Today I'm here. Tomorrow I will be here fairly early in the morning for breakfast. And it has been a joy to reconnect because it looks to me like it is every August beginning last year that I come here. And men's prayer conference has helped me to begin to rethink my manly responsibility. I bless God for each one of you. I do pray the Lord has brought you here to understand something which you can seize for yourself in order that God can make you grow. Our reading today is from 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 is a text given to me to speak on. It reads, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline or sound mind in some versions. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And our theme tonight is freedom from fear and bondage. Freedom from fear and bondage. Very common experience of every living person born of a woman. Fear is nothing new, and bondage is nothing new. But let me start by diagnosing with this question. Where did fear come from? When did, we quite, when did we get hold of fear in our lives? Well, fear came as a result of the fall in the garden. Because Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and they became naked. And when they were naked, they were afraid. They were afraid of themselves. Adam didn't want to look at Eve. Eve didn't want to look at Adam. They were afraid of the creation around them. The birds, the animals, the, the trees, everything else, because they were exposed. But most of all, they were afraid of God. Because God had spoken to them earlier on. And so they did what human beings will always try to do. When he gets himself at a fix, he looks for alternative. They went to get themselves clothing made out of leaves of fig tree. So they sewed it together to cover their nakedness. When you are leaning on what is not substantial, you will drop, you will fall. When you are leaning on the arm of flesh, it will let you down. When you are leaning on a person, they will let you down. It may be your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your wife, your husband. They will let you down. 
So they, they sowed fig leaves to cover their nakedness. They were naked because they were ashamed. And yet, if you read Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, it says, Adam and Eve were naked, but they were never ashamed. Adam and Eve at creation were naked, but they were never afraid. But when the fall came, they began to be afraid of their nakedness. So the root cause of fear in us is the sin of disobedience. They disobeyed God. Adam disobeyed God, so did Eve. Although Eve started and then Adam followed, so they both disobeyed God. That's fear. How about bondage? Well, then bondage at creation was not there. At creation, the man was free. The man was looking after the garden. The man was peaceful. The man was joyful. He was blessed. Because when God blessed him, him in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, he said, go, multiply, fill the earth, rule the birds of the air, and rule the fish in the water. And over all the living things, subdue the earth. At the beginning, God gave Adam and Eve a blessing of rulership. They were rulers. They were able to rule things because they were their first creation. But then when they allowed Satan into their home, they became slaves. What did Satan do? He took the authority. He took the authority. Once he took the authority, then he caged them. He put them in a cage. They became slaves. So then their descendants were also slaves. Because Adam and Eve were slaves, slaves to sin, their children, Cain and Abel, who were not born in the garden, and I've wondered why God you didn't allow them to be born in the garden, but they were not born in the, in the garden, because in the garden was honeymooning the whole time, and after honeymooning they sinned, and when they sinned they were removed out of the garden into a desert-like setting, then we are told in the Bible, Adam knew his wife. And they begot a son called Cain. Now Cain was a slave. Abel was also a slave. How come? Because their parents were slaves. And therefore Cain killed his brother. And he was rude to God. Very rude. When God asked him, where is your brother? He said to God, am I my brother's keeper? Answering God like that is only the word of a slave. He said, yes, the blood of your brother has cried up to heaven. The descendants became slaves. And that's why David, in Psalms 51, verse 5, he said, In sin did my mother conceive me. In sin did my mother conceive me. When I was a fetus in the womb of my mother, I was already a potential sinner. I may I beg you in the name of Jesus, don't call babies angels. They are not. No, they are not. Those are only little human beings. Just give them time. Just give them time. <laughs> that angel will become something else. The very first word the angel will say to you is no. Yeah. In sin did my mother conceive me. Which means we see some certain things in growth of children. When a child is growing, why isn't a child afraid of nakedness? A child can walk around naked, especially if they're hot. They're not afraid. Why? Because they have not yet increased in knowledge. The moment they begin to increase in knowledge, then they become aware of their nakedness. Why? Because when Eve and Adam ate the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's why they began to understand they were naked. So when a child begins to understand, then they begin to look for something to cover themselves. Our forefathers ate that fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There was only one other tree God would not want them to touch, and that was a tree of life. Because if they had touched the tree of life and ate of the tree of life, they would be sinful to the end. God did not allow that. God told them, let's get them out quickly, lest they will touch the fruit of life, the tree of life. I want you to remember, and I want you to remember very clearly, that sin attracts evil forces 
like dirt attracts germs. That's worth writing. Sin attracts evil forces like dirt attracts germs. We are bound, we are in a cage, sort of, because the forces that come into our lives never give us freedom. Evil forces never give you and I freedom. The demons never give you and I freedom. Because the first thing they took through their Lucifer and their chief, chief, chief commander was our authority, our freedom. But thank God, thank God, Jesus came to set us free. The first thing that Jesus did when he died on the cross, he descended. I'm not asking if you know your creed. He descended. What, what, what did he descend to, to, the, to the heads for? To take the key, the authority from Satan. And the moment he came back, has the resurrected Christ. He had the authority. So that all knees shall bow, all tongues shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. He had to go to the dead and get the key from the devil. And once he went to the, to the heads, the devil could not refuse. Why? There was something the Lord did. What he did was to break the power of sin by shedding his blood. And once that blood was shed... It means sin was completely broken, and when it was broken, then the devil didn't have anything to hold on to. And Jesus is the only liberator that came to bring us the freedom that we need. According to Luke chapter 4, verse 18, 18 he came to set the captives free. He came to unlock the cage. He came to unlock the prison gates. He came to release us. He has the power to forgive sins. And he has the power to set us free. Do you know, many times we have deliverance services. Deliverance services. And the, the stronger your voice, the more, think, the more power you think you have. And many times we rebuke demons until we lose our voices. It's not necessary. You don't need the voice you need the authority. A gate that big can only be unlocked by a little key. And the moment sin is cleaned out of a person, the demons don't have anything to hold on to. They're there because sin is dwelling in your heart. The moment sin is released, I want you to go back a few years. We are talking about revival. We are talking about the Tukutene as a revival. One of their strong points was confessing their sins to one another and walking in the light and asking for forgiveness. In those days, delivering services were not necessary. Eh. But today, we have a church that does not know how to confess sins. We have a church that does not know repentance. We have a church that sugarcoats sin. We are walking in the church, we are living in the church, but we are living under the control of sin. And therefore the demons will never ever leave us. If a man of God will chase them out, out of you here in front, they'll wait for you outside there. <laughs> Haven't you noticed that people keep coming for deliverance? Haven't you noticed people keep coming for deliverance? The devil says, I have the right on his life. I have the right on her life. And therefore, unless they're delivered by Jesus through the forgiveness of sins. And if you're doing deliverance, please help the person confess their sins. And help them to come to the knowledge of repentance. Because it is important for you to understand that until our sins are forgiven, the freedom to know how to walk in the power of God is not possible. So he has the power to forgive sins. He has the power to set us free. Praise the Lord. He said to the man who brought their friends through the roof, he said to the guy who was now in front of him, first of all, your sins are forgiven. 
And other people were complaining. He said, how does he forgive sin? He said, what is difficult? Forgiving or letting this guy say, get up and walk. The basic thing that was having a man lie at the pool in John chapter 5 for 38 years, for 38 years paralyzed from his neck to his toes, was sin. The guy was paralyzed because of sin. When Jesus said, take up your, your bed and go, the power of the word released this guy. He got up, picked up his bed, and, and he went. Then the Pharisees met him and said, you guys, what are you doing? Today is the Sabbath. He said, well, I'm obeying orders. The man who healed me said, I should take my bed and go. Why should I disobey him? He went to church. He went to the temple, and they met. And then Jesus said these words to him, see now that you are well, do not sin again. Or something serious or worse will happen to you. He is the deliverer. He is the one who sets us free. Christ died on the cross and he died naked. My friends, if you look at anything that we see in a crucifix with Jesus having a little wrapper around him, that is a creation of us who adore him, but any victim of the cross. During the Roman days, it was not women who were crucified, mainly men. They crucify you naked. They crucify you naked. And the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified naked. Why was he crucified naked? He was crucified naked because he was going to exchange our nakedness to himself on that cross. The bloody shed is a garment of righteousness to cover us from our nakedness. From the days of crucifixion to date, when we come to Jesus Christ, we put on the garment of his righteousness. Because in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. When do you think the first blood was shed? In the Bible. The first blood was shed in the Garden of Eden. Why did God shed blood there? God wanted to dress up Adam and Eve in skin. And that would mean some animals must die so that he can remove the skin and cover our four parents. And that means blood was shed even in the garden so that men can have their nakedness covered. And I want to say to you, my dear beloved, Jesus Christ qualifies to set us free. And only Jesus can set you free. The men of this world cannot. Nobody can set you free. Do you know that he has to set us free from particular things? Number one, he is setting us free by forgiving us our sins. Once you are forgiven, your sins are completely going to go and you begin to know their freedom that you had never known before. He's setting us free from demonic oppression. Some of us are in real problem because we have a burden so heavy and it is put on us by spirits of wickedness and they're called demons. They're there. For me, I don't doubt them because I met them in Namirembe up there. And we had to fight spiritual warfare to let us alone. The very first month we arrived in Namirembe, blue bottle flies came and flooded the palace. You know the blue bottle flies? It took intercessors to pray them out. I give this testimony, people think, ah, but Bishop Romeo, you are so imaginative. No, I'm not. There is reality in dark powers. You, a Ugandan, you should know better than a Muzungu. Because back home there, the problems are there. And here in the city, it's multiplied by 100. It's huge. Demonic oppressions are there. It's only Jesus who can set us from it. When sin is taken away, the demons have nothing to hold on in your life. And I want to tell you that the second thing that the, the Lord sets us for, from is addiction. Addiction. Addiction to alcohol is a very common addiction. 
we struggle to get high. And we can never always remain high. So when we drop below zero, then we take it again and we go a little higher. And the moment you keep taking it more and more, you are hooked onto it and you cannot run away from it. Jesus can set us free. Second addiction is pornography. Today we have such a release of demons of sexual immorality, of sexual immorality in churches, in a cathedral like this, in places of worship. These demons are damaging so many people among the choir, among the leadership, among people who come looking very smart. My friend, the sexual immorality demonic forces are sweeping this country from north to south, east to west. But Jesus can deliver you from that addiction because he has the power to do that. Another addiction that has become so common in the name of pleasure and sports is soccer tournaments. Soccer tournaments, my archbishop loves football. I think he supports a team also somewhere in uh, Europe or something. <laughs> Soccer is beautiful, it's wonderful, until it makes you disagree with your wife. <laughs> Soccer is wonderful and beautiful until it makes you miss your sleep. Soccer can be such a captivating game that you can miss coming to church because you are watching the screen. Soccer has taken some hearts so far away, and they do even betting on it. That's when it becomes an addiction. That's why it has held you in its hand. Sometimes you don't even want to eat at a table. You want to pick your food and put it on your lap as you watch the TV. Let alone the TV itself is also an addiction to some people. Why? Because it controls you. You don't control it. Another addiction which is very common is gambling. The casinos are here in Kampala. The casinos are all over the places in towns and in little cities that we have in Uganda. And people spend money because they want to get money. And they lose the money. Then they go back again and they borrow. And then they lose it again and they go and borrow. And people are caught up in that particular thing which is a, a, itself an addiction. Jesus can set you free from that as well. Another common addiction is love of money. Love of money which the Bible says is a root of all evil. You sleep money, you dream money, you talk money, you walk money, you breathe money. You t and it is so common. Today, there is so much love for money, which is no longer love, but crave and lust for money. You've just picked something in the social media of a priest killing somebody. And the subject matter was money, a priest, a man of God, stabbing a man using a knife. Because the story goes, this man lent him money and he could not pay back. For him, even as a priest, he was willing to kill so that he can get rid of this man who is bothering him. But the prisons are waiting for him. The law is waiting for him. And God is also waiting for him. The love of money, the root of all evil. I want us to talk like Ugandans because there is another one which is a very serious one which Jesus needs to deliver you and me from and that is cultural bondage through mindset. I believe, I think like an Alur, you think like a Muganda, somebody here thinks like a Munyankole, there's another Muchiga here who thinks Muchiga like a Muchiga. The Bama Saba are here. I hear now their circumcision season has begun. And then their cholis are here. And the langis are there. That mindset. That mindset reduces your influence to your own tribe. And you can't go and see beyond. There are issues that we are dealing with because we are restricted in our mindset. And therefore, we can't rise up. When God wants to take us up, we cannot because we are all weighed down with that kind of mindset. But let me tell you something you need to know and you need to embrace particularly tonight because we are given the spirit that we have read about. Number one, we are given the spirit of power. 
not of fear. We are given the spirit of power, and we are talking about the power which is anointing for ministry. According to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You need the power to ride high and be a servant of God, and be a child of God, and be a minister. You know, Alan is talking about the church in his house called the family. Do you know that Jesus Christ has approved that family church way, way, way back in Matthew? He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there. Two means the man and his wife. Three means the family member has arrived. So where there are two people or three people, Jesus said, I'll come. So the very first church we have is your family. And I want to encourage all of you, have an altar there, have an altar there. Let there be a blessing come from the house, and the priest is you, and you're the one who will dispense that blessing on your wife, on your children. I mentioned that the other day, that as you stand tall as a man, you stand tall also, not just physically, like me, I'm 6'5", but you also want to stand tall spiritually. You want to stand tall and be visible that God can count on you that you're leading your wife, that you're leading your children, that you have a stake in making sure that there is godliness like Joshua said, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We have received the spirit of power. The second thing God has given us is a spirit of love. Love for God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then love your neighbor as you love yourself. So let's go this way. The love for God and the love for self, then the love for your neighbor. Because unless you love yourself, you cannot love your neighbor as you love yourself. And how do you love yourself? You love yourself when you know God loves you. You draw the love he has for you in order to love yourself and then love your neighbor. I must confess, there are people here who hate themselves. There are people here who do not like the way they look. There are people here who even don't like their backgrounds. They would have chosen somebody else to be their father or their mother, whatever the case is. Otherwise, you are simply saying to God, you did a big mistake in making me the way I am. The Lord will deliver you even from that mindset. Because the Bible will tell you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it does not want you to be a duplicate. It does not want you to be like somebody who is like somebody. No. You are an identical individual. And the beauty in you can never be compared to any other beauty. You are unique. You are, especially sisters, you listen to me. I would have talked to men, but let me listen. Listen to me. Miss Uganda or Miss Kampala or Miss whatever it is are supposed to be people who are to be role model in beauty and everything else. My friend, you are not Miss Universe. You are Miss Heaven. Your rating is very, very high because the creator, who is a designer, does not duplicate. You know, when you look at Chinese, you think they look alike, but they don't. <laughs> if you look very carefully, they are not the same. So you love yourself and love what you have, and please love yourself, because if you don't, you have a problem. You're not going to be like them. Boys, if you're choosing girls, look at that woman in totality. Don't say, I wish she had the head of Anne and she had the neck of Mary and I wish she would have the bust of Christine or had the legs of... No, she is a total, complete human being. Love her the way you are and then you will love your neighbor easily. Then the last gift God has given us is a spirit of self-discipline. The spirit of self-discipline. Now, the, the spirit of self-discipline is a spirit of self-control. God has given you the spirit of power. He's given you the spirit of love. He has given you the spirit of self-discipline. But there is a fourth one, which is in Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. It is a spirit of sonship by which we call God Abba, Father. Abba, Father. We did not receive the spirit of slavery 
to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship, the spirit of adoption, so that you are able to call God Dad, Papa, Abba, intimately. Do you know him that intimately? Do you connect with him at that intimate level? He has given you permission. He has given you permission to connect with him at that intimate level. So that you call him dad. I have grown in my ministry across this country and even beyond, and I've been given the title dad. I have got children whom I didn't even know, but they call me dad. And the reason is very simple. I have a heart that goes to them, and I have arms that draw them to me. How do I manage? The Holy Spirit gift. When I can walk and up and down in this country, then I have also learned that until I connect with Abba Father, I can betray my own children very easily. But I know him. I know Abba Father. You even know him because Jesus taught you to call him our Father, who is in heaven. You are holy. You are the king. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. It is being done in heaven. And so you have a father. The spirit that you have is not the spirit of slavery to make you fall back into fear. No. Now I feel I need to come to a conclusion. But let me give you my conclusion. I want you to listen very carefully. Jesus said these words. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. According to John chapter 8 verse 36, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. All of us here are entitled to freedom as far as God is concerned. Are you free? If you are free, you make God happy. If you are not free, God weeps. Because he has put it on you, for you on the table, and you say, choose life or choose death. Some people deliberately choose hell on earth by walking away from God, by turning their backs to God. And I, I'm just so surprised because God never even stops you, by the way. When you make a choice, even archangels cannot stop you. Even God cannot stop you. When you decide you are going to go left, and God said, no, let's go straight. But you say, no, God, I understand where I'm going. And that's what we are, human beings. I know what I'm doing. Do you? Do you know the destination? Do you know where you're going to end up? So if you walk away from God, you break the heart of God. You remember this boy in Luke chapter 15. He came to his dad and he said, dad, give me what belongs to me. I am tired of home. I want to go away from here. Loving father gave him what he needed or what belonged to him. He packed up and he left. Now Jesus in that parable said these words. He went very far away. Meaning he's going to go to a land where he is a stranger and he does not know people there. But he was loaded. He had money. And when you have money, there are guys who smell money. Even in Kampala here, there are guys who smell money. They are called pickpockets. You do not know how they know you have money, but they do know. They came to him for his money. He squandered that money. He wasted that money. He gave that money for anything he loved to satisfy his flesh. The money got finished. A famine came on. The friends who loved the money, when money was finished, they disappeared. They did not love him. They did not love him. If you are working for URA and you have friends, watch out because you have money. Some of those money are money friends. Then he began to look for work. Nobody could give him any, any employment at all. He didn't look it at all. By this time, all he could get, the best job, was looking after pigs. Now, to make the story literally a big contrast is this. This is a Jewish son of a wealthy man. And as a Jew, you cannot look after pigs because it's an unclean animal. But circumstances forced him to look after pigs. It is there when he hit the wall, like many of us, many times we remember God when we're in trouble, aren't we? When you are hitting the wall, then you say, God, where are you? He remembered father. He remembered home. He remembered love. He remembered security back home. And he said to himself, I will arise. 
I'll go back home. Now he'll tell my father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son because I have aborted my sonship. Treat me as one of your servants. He was rehearsing this in his mind until at the right moment he made a decision and he acted on that decision. He got up. Look at me. This guy is going home empty-handed, half-naked. Malnourished and dirty. Smelling pigs and unpresentable. But he's going home anyway. It's not the way he looks. It is the direction he has taken. The direction he's taken is going home. And he has got in his heart a locked up poem he's going to give to his father. But you know what happened. From a distance, dad saw son. Dad got up. Dad ran. Now, according to the Oriental, this cannot happen. A rich man in flowing robes to stand up and run for a wayward son, it doesn't happen. But this particular dad is different. He's running, he's going to his son, he's uh, embracing his son, he's kissing his son. And the son began to say to, to him, Dad, I've seen that again in heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Do you know he interrupted at that point? I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He ordered for a robe. And not just a robe, the best robe. He ordered for a ring. And not just a ring, but a ring or belonging as a son to the father. He ordered for shoes. And that shoes is a shoes of identity. Come on, dad, why don't you allow him to go and shower? <laughs> no need for showering. It is his nakedness which is worrying me. I don't want him to be naked. Showering can come later on. Let us celebrate. And you know, it was not just any animal, but the animal they have been preparing for a VIP, fatten animal. A celebration began. This is God. This is God. This is God who does not care what you look like as long as you come home. Who does not care how you smell as long as you come home. Who does not care what sin you committed this morning as long as you come home. Because coming home is his agenda. His waiting and love is patient. He restored his son. Let him restore you. Let him give you that freedom that only can belong to a son and a daughter in the family. Because when the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Secondly, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. No. You are not a slave anymore. On that cross, your shackles were broken. On that cross, your identity card was replaced. Your citizenship was restored. On that cross, he, you became the real you according to God's own plan for you. On that cross. Now all we need is to walk to him. And say, Lord, I'm home. I don't look it, but you don't care how I look, but I am home. We are no longer slaves. You are not actually a slave. If you are in slavery, I want to give you the good news. The good news is today, he will tell you, the door is open, you come in. The door is open. The spirit God has given us a spirit not to fall back into fear. Thirdly, there was a man called Jairus, a head of a synagogue. His daughter was very ill. He came to Jesus and said, Lord, come, come heal my daughter. She's only 12. She's a teenager. She's dying. And he got up to go. People were pushing him. But there was one particular push and a touch which was totally different. It belonged to a woman who was bleeding and had been bleeding for 12 years. She's also looking for a solution. She said, the best I can do is to touch the hem of his garment. And when she did that, her bleeding stopped. She was healed immediately. Now, that little delay cost Jairus the life of his daughter. A messenger came, don't disturb the teacher anymore, your daughter is dead. And he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, only believe your daughter will be healed. Don't be afraid. God can do for you what nobody can do. Never ever fear what has been bothering you. It could be loans, and you are just not sure. Maybe you want to flee to Kenya, but don't. There are riots there. You are under stress, 
because things are not working in your family, your wife is a, 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 a harassment. You know, many of us men, we think our wives harass us with questions. Questions. You, know, you do hear us saying, woman, why are you nagging me? Because there are women who ask questions without a break. Now the guy is trying to think about the first question, the second one comes, and the third one comes, and the fourth one comes, and the fifth one comes. He just stays like a stone. He said, now woman, what is the problem? Give me time to think. I want to think. <laughs> Let's go home. He went home, picked the girl by the hand, and he said, little girl, my child, get up. She got up. And, she's, and he said, give, them, give her food to eat. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Do not allow fear to control your life. I also want you to know that Jesus is a giver of the life of freedom. That Jesus gives us the freedom that we really need. We, each, of, each one of us, seriously, we need freedom. We just want to be freed, free to do what we are and to be who we are. You can't always trim yourself and try to look what you are not. You get tired. You just want to be ordinary. And that is why if you go home, you are a normal person. If you are coming to the office, you are an abnormal person. Because you must behave anyway. And you try to behave your office and your standard. But the moment you go home, you are a normal person. And God wants you to be feeling at home even in your office. God wants you to feel at home even as you travel. He gives you that freedom not to try and compare yourself with other people. No, you are you and you'll always be you and you'll die like you. Freedom. And that freedom is for your taking. And in Christ, there is abundant life. The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Paul would say these words to you. Listen to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is a spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Once the spirit of God embraces you to himself, he releases you. He releases you to be and to do. He releases you to become effective at your own pace. He releases you to walk with God at, his, at your own pace. The Lord said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm gentle, I'm humble. The Spirit of the Lord releases us to be who we are. Are you being harassed by, by opinion of people? You want to behave like people want you to behave? No, you are not a slave. You are a free person. And you better behave like a free person and walk like a free person and act like a free person. Some of us here, because we want a job, we compromise our sanctity, our morality. We, sanct we compromise our bodies for money, for employment. Why do you want to get yourself into a cage? Can he who feeds the birds and dresses the flowers of the field not feed you, not dress you up? What, what do you want? What, do you want the latest car? What do you do with the latest car anyway? Because the latest car today will not be the latest car tomorrow. The latest phone today will not be the latest phone next week. If you are harassed by the latest, you can never stop. Because they are produced every now and again. Get what you can and be satisfied. And satisfaction can only come to a one who is a free person. Does it matter if I'm using the analog? Must I always be in a smartphone? Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Let me declare to you, you are blessed Amen. to be a ruler, Amen. not a slave. Amen. God's blessing from Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 is to make you a ruler and not a slave to anything, not addicted to anything, not harassed by any attitude, not disturbed by anybody. Please, tonight you are a ruler. And God would love you to be a ruler. God would love you to be one who is free to serve because serving him is freedom. And when the sun sets you free, when the sun sets you free, 
you will be free indeed. Stand up. So it is seven o'clock, and the Lord God is speaking to many people. Thank you, Father God, for your wonderful love to us. Thank you, Father God, that you have set us free from fear and from bondage. I will love that music to stop because you, musician, God wants to bless you as well. You have already blessed us. He wants to bless you too. I want to bless the Lord who has made you listen to this message. I believe the Holy Spirit who has spoken to you is interested in your freedom. The Holy Spirit is interested that you are not a slave to fear, addicted to anything. The Holy Spirit wants you to be a child of God. And once a child of God, you are treasured like the apple of his eyes. You are so unique. That is his workmanship. You have got a life to live. He knows the beginning and the end, and he alone knows it. You are privileged to stand in this cathedral because God wants you to understand that whatever has caged you, has made you a slave, he is going to release it. That you will know what freedom is. That you will know what power is. That you will know and understand that the Lord God loves you. That you will also understand that he is a God who has given you the spirit of self-control. The spirit not of slavery, but the spirit of adoption. So that you can call God, Daddy, Abba, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because you are releasing people. You are flashing out fears out of people. Some people have understood something that you have said, that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. For some people tonight is your first time to hear the truth that God is the one who can flash out your fears, who can replace fear with faith, that God is the only one who can give you the courage to stand no matter how fierce the life is. You will stand in the storm because he's in the storm. He's the one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's the same God who says, you are my beloved. And so freedom is yours. If you are crippled by fear, in Jesus' name, I break the power of that fear. If you have been afraid in any way, for anything, that is not where you belong. Adam and Eve were afraid because they were naked. But God can clothe you. God can clothe you with his righteousness. I thank you, Father God, that you have brought us together as children. Tonight, I want to tell you what the Spirit of God is saying to me. The Lord wants to give you boldness instead of fear. When Peter was in the courtyard of that high priest. He was so paralyzed by fear. He denied Jesus Christ three times. Possibly you are also denying him and hiding your light under a bushel. But on the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, when power came on Peter, Peter stood up. Peter preached a gospel. Peter declared a gospel. And 3,000 people made commitment to Jesus. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And if fear has paralyzed you, he's here to give you boldness. He's here to give you power. He's here to make you know he loves you. And he's here to give you self-discipline. Many of us will surrender our fear to him. And many of us also will say to him, Lord, get me out. Get me out. The Holy Spirit is asking you to do that. The Holy Spirit is asking you to come forward and to let go to him that which has been your burden. And may you please come. Because he's going to bless you tonight. Thank you.
please come. Walk forward, please. It pleases God when his people are free. It pleases God when his people run like children in a home. It pleases God when his people are not afraid of anything or anybody. It pleases God when he knows that he came to give freedom, and that freedom can never be given by anybody else. Thank you. Keep coming. Keep coming. The Spirit has spoken to you. He's calling you to come. Jesus Christ wants to give you what only Jesus can give. Thank you very much. Keep walking. Keep walking. People out there in the tent, you can still come because the aisle is free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. When God is at work, allow him to do that in your life. When God has spoken to you, give him a chance. You lose nothing by giving him a chance. You lose nothing completely, but you gain everything. You gain what God can give to his people. You gain what God has kept for you from the beginning of the foundations. That what he has planned for you will never ever be taken by anybody else. Thank you, Lord. That you remember us even in our weakness. You remember us even when we are frail. You remember us when we have lost our way. You remember us when things have been stuck with us. Some of us have struggled in our families for a long, long time and we don't know what happened. Some of us are coming back from, from what we don't even understand. Our parents, our grandparents have put us at a fix. You can be the beginning of freedom in the lineage of your family by the power of the Holy Spirit that he has given you to receive that which God has given for free. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for your children. You love us so much that you gave Christ to reveal you to us. He revealed your love to us. He revealed your power to us. When you walked this planet earth, there was no condition that was beyond you. You spoke and things happened. You touched and things happened. You declared and things happened. Even the wind had to obey you. Even the waves had to obey you. Jesus Christ, tonight, your children are here because they need to know that they have a place where they can be free of fear, where they can be free from anything that has bound them for so long. They are here because they know the only one who can set them free is Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord. Will you pray with me? Say, Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to pray like one who is released and forgiven. Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That you died for me and you died naked. So that your righteousness can cover my nakedness. When you died for me, I was forgiven. So I have been crucified with you. The life I live, I live by faith. From now onwards, release me. Release me from fear. Fear of people. Fear of events. Fear of the future. Fear of demonic forces. Fear of enemies. Fear of those who don't like me. Make me depend on you. Because you are my defense. Lord Jesus, I thank you that when you died, you went to hell and you took the key, the authority the devil had taken away. And you gave it to me. Even tonight. I have the key. I'm a child of God. I am a ruler over animals, over water, the fish in the water, and the birds in the air. I will rule with Christ because he has given me the authority. I stand to surrender myself. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for making you sad. 
forgive me for disappointing you. But I pledge my allegiance from today onwards, I will follow you. I will trust you. I will lean on you. I will depend on you. In Jesus' name. And the child say amen. amen. Let me bless you. King Jesus, only your spirit can do what you are seeing. Only you who know the hearts of all your people. Only you who knows the struggles of all your people. These ones in front of us, the ones in the sanctuary there, many cannot understand where they began, and most will not understand where they are going. But you know, you are the Alpha, you are the Omega. You know the beginning, you know the end. You see what people cannot see, you hear what people cannot hear. Your people want to trust you, give them faith, Lord. Your people want to lean on you, give them a pillar to lean on. Your people want to follow you, be the shepherd they can follow. Let them hear you say, follow me. Your people want your blessings tonight. Holy Spirit, pour it on their hearts. Their lack all over the place. Fulfill all those lacks one after another. Draw them to yourself and make them your children by the confession of their mouth. And by believing in their hearts, the Lord bless you. The Lord's favor rest upon your life. The Lord's hand rest on your life. Rest on your work. Rest on your going out and coming in. The Lord's favor rest on your family back there. May he remember your family back there. May he bless your family there because of you. May favor come on them as well tonight. May the spirit of the Lord breathe life in your life and confidence. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you all, my beloved, now and forevermore. And the church say, Amen, amen. and amen. Amen. Amen.